Psalm 16, Shiviti Adonai, I have set the eternal always before me. God is at my side. I shall not be moved. Shiviti Adonai, Leneg de Tamid, Kimi Mini Bo Lehemot. Lachen samach libi vayagel kavodi af besari ishkon lavetach ki lo tazov nafshi lishol lo titen chas dechalerot shachat todi eini Chaim, sova semachot et panechat neimot b'min chanetzach. Shiviti Adonai lenegdi tamid ki mimini bo. We gather today with heavy hearts to bid farewell to your beloved patriarch, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, husband, brother, community leader, and dear friend. Murray died on Yom Kippur, the holiest and most solemn day of the Jewish calendar. And this evening, just four days later, we begin the celebration of the holiday of Sukkot, which is a festive and joyful gathering. So we stand between those two emotions today, the solemnity, the sadness, the grief of losing a loved one, but also the great joy in knowing that he lived such a full and rich life and leaves such a legacy behind. Murray left the world considerably better than he found it. It is our custom to listen to the voice of our sacred scriptures in this time of grief as in times of joy. And so we're going to begin by listening to the words of the 23rd Psalm, first in Hebrew. Adonai roi lo echzar binodeshe yarbitzeni almei menuchot yinachaleni nafshi yishovev Yanheni bema'aglei tzedek lema'an shemo. Gam ki elech begeit salmavit, lo ira ra ki eta imadi. Shiftecha umishantecha hema yinachamuni. Ta'aroch lefanai shulchan neged sorai. Dishanta veshemen roshi, kosi revaya. Ach to vachesed yirdefuni kol yeme chayai. Veshavti bevet adonai leorech yamim. These words of the 23rd Psalm remind us that as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that we are not alone, that God is with us. And today there are many loving friends who I hope also bring a sense of comfort to the family. And so we're going to recite these words together in the English. I invite you to join me if you know the words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And now we turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, which is read on Sukkot. For everything there is a season, a time for every experience under heaven. 
a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose. For everything there is a season, a time for every experience under heaven. So one of the things about Murray that we'll hear more about in just a few minutes was his playful spirit and his creative energy. And at the time of each of his son's bar mitzvahs, he wrote lyrics to a popular song and then made his son sing that song at their bar mitzvah. So all four of the Dubbin boys know the words to all four of the songs, and they have chosen one of those songs to play here today, and that is Gentle on My Mind. I don't know if I can do as good as the Dubbins, but I'll try. Or Glenn Campbell or Patty Page, but here we go. It's knowing you don't try to buy my freedom with some promise made of gold. That for you my door stays open and our love becomes a simple two-way street. And it's knowing we're not shackled by forgotten words and bonds And the ink stains that have dried upon some line That keeps you on the back roads by the rivers of my memory That keeps you ever gentle on my mind It's not clinging to the rocks and ivy Planted on some column that now binds us Or something that somebody said Because they thought that we fit together walking It's just knowing that the world will not be cursing or forgiving When I'm drifting through the marketplace and find that you're moving on the back roads by the river of my memory and for hours you're just gentle on my mind well the wheat fields and the clotheslines and the junkyards and the highways come between us and some other woman crying to her mother cause she turned and you were gone I still might walk for hours, tears of joy might stain my face, and a summer sun might burn me till I'm blind. But not to where I cannot see you moving on the back roads, by the rivers gently flowing on my mind. The shutters creak and autumn winds that make me draw inside myself in silence. Cause now I sit and watch the endless chase of leaves across my yard. And laying down my hairbrush, I lean back within my window seat and find that you're moving on the back roads by the rivers of my memory ever smiling ever gentle on my mind thank you cantor so i brought with me here today 
the symbols of Sukkot, which we'll use later this evening when Sukkot begins, these four symbols, um, called the Lulav and the Etrog. And I brought them because our tradition says that each one of the four symbols represents a different kind of Jew. And the Etrog is the only one of the four that has both scent and taste. And so our tradition says that the etrog represents a person who is both learned and a mensch. And that was Murray Dubbin. As a friend of Eric's growing up, and yes, we did go to the prom together. Get that out of the way. <laughs> I remember Murray with a twinkle in his eye and a spring in his step. He and Helene created a home together that was warm and loving and friendly and down to earth. Murray was always humble about his own accomplishments, but not so much when he came to his sons, Cliff, Sam, David, and Eric, about whom he was so proud and for very good reason. The last time I spoke to him was right before the summer. We spoke at some length. And he was filled with so much pride for Eric's new cantorial prowess, which he really wanted me to listen to. And I'm going to get to hear a little bit of it later on today. He, Murray, led such a remarkable life. And we're going to get to hear uh, about lots of it chronologically. We're going to start by hearing from his sister, Bonnie. And so, Bonnie, I'd like to call you up at this time. on my phone what I want to say. As my cousin Sandra said, Murray had a long and interesting life. He had a good life. He had those successful kids the rabbi mentioned, successful grandchildren, wonderful, beautiful great-grandchildren and a life partner he loved for over 71 years. For some reason, that is the thing that touches my heart the most, the relationship between dear Helene and my brother. I am one of three who have known him the longest. And if my sister Sandra was here, she'd be speaking for sure. Of course, her perspective was different than mine because I was quite a bit younger. I remember Murray as a young person, not that young as he did have 11 and a half years on me, but mostly as a teen and a young man. And that's really how I think about him, as a young person. My first memory was during the war. We lived in a house that my parents re rented for some inexplicable reason. Murray was sick, very sick, and we weren't allowed in his room. Here, in this place of truth, I confess, I sneaked in. <laughs> Murray was a very cute and charming boy and he had those blue eyes. Girls lined up around the block for him, but he picked the best, my big sister, Helene. Murray was funny, too, sometimes a bit bawdy. I remember watching him flex his muscles to his reflection in the mirror. He declared he looked like 
just like Van Johnson. You young people probably don't even know who that is. He learned to flex his pecs, too. He could, he, he could do it one at a time. <laughs> he could wiggle his ears. And he taught the family how to use chopsticks. My mother said that's all he learned at college. <laughs> Murray had good friends. And they would come and hang out in his room. Murray would play the harmonica or he would, or, they, or sing along to his ukulele. Red Hot Mama, again, I don't know if you kids know that. And It's Only a Shanty in Old Shanty Town. Those are two songs I remember that he sang. I would wander in and sit with the guys. He never kicked me out. Murray was good to me. He went to court with me to fight a ticket, consoled me when I fought with my mother, and he told me that all the frat boys thought I was pretty. I was only seven. <laughs> he used his charms on me, too. Murray had a long and interesting life. Um, he, he saw so many amazing changes in Miami and the world. But Murray knew and remembered the family history. Who will remember it now? I can go down over here. Thank you, Bonnie. That was wonderful. So when I was speaking to the Dubbin boys about their dad on a Zoom the other day, I was reminded of this precious story from the Talmud that is about a person who is in the desert, parched, and really on their last legs, and not sure if they're going to be able to make it any further. And they see a tree in the distance, and they make their way toward the tree, and the tree really saves their life. Uh, it has shade, protects them from the sun, and there's fruit growing from the tree that's delicious. And after being revived, the man wants to go forward, and he says to the tree, how shall I bless you for saving my life? How shall I bless you? I cannot say, may your shade be plentiful, because it already is. I cannot say, may your fruit be sweet, because it already is. Let me bless you by saying, may the shoots that pour forth from you be just as you are. And that was Murray's blessing. These four beautiful sons, their wives, their children. Uh, this was his greatest, I think he would say, blessing of all, along with his love of his life, Helene. So each of his sons is going to have an opportunity to share about their dad, and we're going to start with the oldest, Cliff. Public speaking has always been stressful to me. As a physician, talking one-on-one -on -one with my patients is my sweet spot, but I'll do my best. Dad was well known for being meticulous and extremely well organized. In early 2020, in anticipation of his granddaughter Karen and Reed's wedding, he bought a suit. Unfortunately, when the COVID global pandemic was announced several days before the wedding, we did not let him go to the wedding. He watched on FaceTime. He never got to wear the suit. Fast forward to this spring, when faced with a recurrent cancer, he bought the suit that he wanted to be buried in, eventually. Dad did not anticipate the ravages of cancer that would have on his body. The suit that he bought was not going to fit, but the one that he bought for the wedding would. 
So dad, since you couldn't be buried in the new suit, I'm wearing it for you today. When dad became ill this summer, very ill, we had to convince him to enter the hospital. He desperately didn't want to leave Helene and hated being in a hospital. But as he told my brother Sam and me, he said, I don't want to go to the hospital, but I don't want to become eternal. So he went. When it became obvious that we had run out of options to prolong his life, he said to me, Cliff, I hit the ball, I've hit, I have hit the ball as far as I can. I told him, Dad, Mom is going to be okay. You hit the ball out of the park. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Sam? Not off to a good start. <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult enough, thank you, Rabbi, to speak about our father, Murray Dubbin, a great man and a great father we will all sorely miss. And it is difficult to cover his, the life of a man who lived such a rich and beautiful life for 93 years. It's even hard to cover the 67 years that I've been a part of it. But I'll try to speak about three aspects of dad's life and legacy, public service as a father, husband, grandfather, and great-grandfather, and, and is Murray the man. And while I still have my composure, let me thank everyone here for being here, for your love and friendship for dad. <laughs> Dad was elected to the Florida legislature in 1963 at the age of 33. For the first two sessions, he and mom moved all of us to Tallahassee in a two-car caravan. They rented out their house in South Miami and rented houses in Tallahassee for all of us to live in for the first two sessions. We enrolled in school up there. Mom and dad did everything possible to keep us, keep our lives normal. Of course, it was anything but. Even as young kids, we knew our dad was a special person in the legislature. My brothers and I breathed the air of the Capitol and the politics at that time. We worked as pages and messengers, bringing coffee and messages and notes to members and eavesdropping on meetings in dad's office and in our apartment. I have fond memories of legislators putting their arm around me and telling me that my father was a uniquely brilliant fair, and effective member of the legislature. That stuck with me. Dad served at a time known as the golden age of Florida government, alongside Lawton Childs, Ruben Askew, Dick Pettigrew, Ralph Turlington, Bob Shevin, Lewis Wolfson, Marshall Harris, Sandy D'Allenberg, Don Reed, Buddy McKay, Ken Myers, Bob Hartnett, and others. He held several leadership roles in the House of Representatives, the most important being Chairman of the Constitutional Revision Committee in 1968 and Chairman of the Rules Committee from 1970 to 74 under Speakers Dick Pettigrew and Terrell Sessoms. Dad was a leader among visionaries who brought modern government to Florida with a new constitution, open government and environmental protections, law enforcement and judicial reforms, and educational institutions like Florida International University to serve the state's urban populations. Let me pause to introduce Dick Pettigrew, Dad's close friend and political ally. Dick was the Speaker of the House from 1971 to 72 and one of the all-time greats. Dick, I speak for Mom and my brothers and our spouses and kids to say that we're very honored that you and Ann are here today to honor Dad. In 1971, Dad received the Florida Times Union Award named for the longtime House clerk, Alan Morris, as the most valuable member of the House of Representatives. That was a very big deal. 
particularly in the company that he kept in Tallahassee, and he was very proud of that honor. It's hard to believe that Dad and Lewis Wilson were the first two Jewish legislators elected to the legislature from South Florida in the modern era, in 1963. They were followed in, in the ensuing years and decades by several other Jewish members of the House and Senate. Because the legislature convened in the spring, we had Passover in Tallahassee with other Jewish legislators. They began in very small rooms, but grew substantially over the years. There's Elaine Bloom and Dan Gelber and Nan Rich could attest, along with some of the other luminaries who, who followed in their footsteps. Dad was very proud of his role in creating FIU in the legislature between 1965 and 1972 and making it a full four-year university as a member of the Board of Regents. His most cherished achievement was steering the new Florida Constitution to passage in 1968 to replace the outdated 1885 Constitution. The legislature had been in extended session throughout the summer of 1968, long after they were supposed to go home. Tempers were short. In his closing speech, Dad spoke of the blood, sweat, and tears that had been devoted to crafting moder the modern Constitution for, the, for a modern state. Those words were not cliché. They reflected what I knew Dad had been living in that period. And after the yeas won the vote, the chamber erupted in exultant applause. And as the Herald reported today, Dad's biggest disappointment was the House's failure to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment for Women in 1973. In his closing speech, Dad gestured with his hands and modulated his voice, quoting sources ranging from the play 1776, a family favorite, to the Passover Haggadah for the expansion of human liberty in every generation. When the vote failed, the sadness was palpable. Ironically, the amendment had passed the House in 1972, but didn't pass the Senate that year. And unfortunately, the ERA opponents organized in 1973 and bombarded members with a misleading scare campaign that, that doomed the effort. Overall, however, Dad was very proud of the respect and cooperation among legislators of that era, regardless of their different political affiliations or personal backgrounds. They argued over policy, but usually did so in the spirit of doing the people's work, solving problems, and planning for the state's future needs. And this sensibility is consistent with what many have cited as Dad's quiet effectiveness and willingness to get things done without seeking the limelight. Dad understood that governing, whether in the legislature, the Board of Regents, City of Miami Beach Commission, the most important qualities were listening, respecting others, and hammering out solutions that would serve the public interest. As many of you know, sometimes the hammering was more intense than others, but his record speaks volumes. Dad also loved recounting his days as Miami Beach City Attorney, working with leaders like Mayor Seymour Gelber, David Dermer, and Neeson Kasdan, and building the City Attorney's Office into what he called the most outstanding municipal law firm in Florida. He was thrilled when the city honored him with a beautiful ceremony and proclamation on his 90th birthday, establishing August 1, 2019 as Murray Dubbin Day in the city of Miami Beach. And since Lori and I raised our family in Miami, our children and we were lucky to spend a lot of time with mom and dad. And you'll hear from our sons, Rob, Jeff, and Andy about that. And in the last several years, Lori and I and David and Susan brought brunch to their apartment most weekends. Dad and I talked almost every day during the pandemic. He called me on January 6th to tell me that the rioters had stormed the U.S. Capitol. I was, I was working on a brief. Uh, he joined with a group of about 50 former Democratic state legislators to support Joe Biden in 2020 and to educate the public about the high stakes of losing our democracy. When, it, it, just a month ago, when he was recuperating from a recent procedure, he insisted that I participate on one of the Zoom calls with the, with the legislators. Quote, there should be a dubbin in that meeting, he insisted. Of course, I did it. Dad was determined to stay alive, especially for mom. And by surviving these past two years, he lived to meet our new grandson, Marcus, who Jeff and Marta brought here a few weeks ago, when Dad was very, very alert. Rob and Andy came that same weekend as well, and Mom and Dad were ecstatic to have everyone together, as were we. 
Mom and Dad's bedroom wall is filled with color printouts of Marcus and their other great-grandchildren. And when Jeff took Mar Marcus back in that room, they didn't know it was there. He, was, he just was delighted to see all of those color pictures of him and the other great-grandchildren. Dad was incredibly lucid throughout these painful months and weeks. He followed my important and even less important cases and lived long enough to see me win victories in the Supreme Court and the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals in the Pizarro Holocaust painting case and the Cuban doctor's cases. He understood that we still have work to do in both of those cases in the lower courts, and as recently as 10 days ago, when I was with Dad in the ER for about seven hours, he said in typical Murray style, you have interim victories in the painting and Cuban doctor's cases. <laughs> Vintage Murray, keeping it real. Yes, you won a Supreme Court and DC Circuit case, but those victories are interim, and you have more steps to take before you can claim victory. Dad was very happy that Lori and I were able to spend several months up north with Marcus as an infant and toddler while I could work remotely. So my brothers and I have received so many wonderful calls, texts, and emails from people who knew and loved Dad. I wish I could quote them all. One that especially captured Dad is from senior federal judge Pat Seitz. Quote, they certainly don't make them like your dad. He was so very special, one of a kind. I loved his ready big smile, his sense of humor, his ability with quotable quotes, and his good-hearted kindness to me and everyone else with whom I saw him interact. We all have our list of favorite Murray aphorisms, which the kids call Papa Murrayisms. I think my favorite was, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And of course, it was also his unforgettable wedding toast for Lori and me. Kids, have fun. <laughs> they gave each other unbelievable support over the years. Dad can never have accomplished his political successes without mom's loyal and effective partnership. And dad was mom's biggest cheerleader in getting her degrees at FIU and her wonderful community work for the patrons of the Museum of Science the Theodore Gibson Foundation, and the Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU. So yes, Dad was a great man and a great father, but I wanted to dispel any myth, however, that he was a candidate for sainthood. We all know he lost his temper now and then, and that his vocabulary was peppered with four-letter words. And that spirit was aflame to the end as well. When Dad was having some trouble swallowing and coughing at night, I reminded him that his doctor recommended getting a hospital bed that could be raised and lowered. He looked at me with those steely blue eyes, a stare we all know well, and said, there is no effing way that I'm going to sleep anywhere except in our bed right next to your mother. Vintage Murray to the end. We all love you and we miss you, Dad. Beautiful. David. Pardon my notes. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm David, the third brother. When I was born, we had just moved to a brand new house in South Miami. Dad and Mom picked a great neighborhood for us to grow up in. The neighborhood was so close that friends from the neighborhood are here today. The Michelsons and the Bernsteins, Larry, Jeff, Carol, and Andy. And all the other friends were almost like in our neighborhood from high school and Everywhere in between, I really appreciate everybody who came. It would have meant a lot to Dad. If it seems like I'm rambling going forward, it's first of all hard to find a spot given the meaningful and eventful life that my father lived. Plus, my two older brothers already took the good stuff. <laughs> Hmm. 
In fact, the rabbi took one of the good things too, and 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 my, and my aunt Bonnie talked about the ukulele and the bar mitzvah songs. But he was also he was very musical. He was in the Glee Club, which a lot of people may not have remembered. Bonnie remembers. You may have also heard that he loved performing in musicals in college and in later productions at our temple, Temple Beth Am, with their theater group. His musical flair was carried on by his granddaughter, Karen. Karen was in the High School of the Arts, and she majored in musical theater and performed in several school productions like Grease and The Boyfriend. I loved her in the pink hair as Frenchie as in Grease. We all have fond memories of dad and mom swing dancing to old records in our living room. This is a tradition that Susan and I have carried on. We took dancing lessons to cope with having an empty nest after our kids went away to college. The musical theme continues with a previously alluded to topic of uh, songs at our bar mitzvah. Starting with Cliff, Dad would take a popular song of the day and add lyrics that were related to our lives. The version that Lisa sang did not have the same lyrics that Sam had to sing at his bar mitzvah. Mine was written to the tune of a song, One Tin Soldier. It was popular in the movie Billy Jack at the time. But instead of listen, listen children to a story, as the first line, it said, in a house in South Miami lived a dad and mother too, and two brothers, but they found that they were just too few. The other songs were to the tune of Sesibon for Cliff. You've already heard Gentle on My Mind, and Eric's was to the tune of the night has a thousand eyes. In addition to what you've already heard, um, I only have one more humorous aphorism to share since Sam already told one. <laughs> it was, I'm busier than a one-armed paper hanger. Even when he was younger, uh, dad brought distracted driving to the new level. In, in his older years, with his eyesight diminishing, we certainly had our job cut out for us to help him uh, give up his car keys. But one of the skills that he displayed, he was able to steer the car with his knee while he packed his pipe with tobacco and lit it. Politics has been a huge part of his life. In fact, Dad's political philosophy was also instituted at home. This family is a democracy, but I have 51% of the vote. <laughs> Dad was also a gifted cartoonist. He drew cartoons in his college newspaper. And instead of doodling like most people would doodle, he would draw caricatures of the people in his meetings and give them to him afterwards. Dad's career longevity was epic. At the age of 65, when most people are thinking about retirement, Mr. Gelber called up Dad and asked him to take a new job as city attorney for Miami Beach. And he worked 10 more years at that job. You've heard by now how devoted dad was to mom. They held hands and they kissed all the time. At the end of, the at, at the end of his life, his driving force was taking care of her. Karen tells me that dad had a special way of encouraging his grandchildren to hug him. 
I'll look to the grandchildren and see if this resonates with them. He told him, he told them that every hug they gave him would give him an extra year of life. I'm sure dozens more hugs were given, but you know, we're all, inf we're all affected by inflation. <laughs> if you've noticed something about the way I've been speaking, that's dad in the room. Dad coached me on how to make my bar mitzvah speech. He said, it's always the best practice when public speaking to pause three seconds after every sentence. I hope I was able to come close to following his advice. And I thank you all for coming and streaming today. I'd like to introduce you to my youngest brother, Eric. Thank you, Dave. I'm number four. That's pretty much what I am. <laughs> My wife asked me, do you ever get tired of being number four? I go, that's what I am. I'm number four. All right, I'll get a little closer. Thank you, Lisa. So yes, Dad was a quipster. One of my favorites is uh, I do some work in the federal space, and I help teams sort of interact with each other. and get to the meat of their issue, which involves talking about their feelings. As you might guess, people don't like talking about their feelings. And so I said to them once, as my dad would say, it, when you guys talk about your feelings, it's so quiet. <laughs> I'm, cleaning, I'm doing the clean version. I said, it's so quiet, you could hear a mouse tinkling on cotton. <laughs> yeah. Kellyanne reminded me of one uh, dad used to say driving around town. He'd say, Miami's a great town if they ever finished it. <laughs> so mom always said, children learn what's caught, not what's taught. And so I, I have stolen that line. I have used it many, many times. And I'm going to, my um, eulogy here is going to focus more on what I have caught from mom and dad and uh, uh, what I have perhaps passed on to those who've caught them some things from me. Um, both public servants, dedicate your life to the greater good. Uh, I certainly followed in that path. It was re referred to before, and I want to just reiterate, he was a very demonstrably publicly loving, affectionately shown person. Well, up to, uh, well into my teens, my 20s, public demonstrations of affection, hugging, kissing, very much demonstrable in that way, and uh, unapologetic about it. And I always felt that was um, uh, certainly a great model for me, and how I feel is uh, comfortable expressing that as well. Um, now, Dad and I did butt heads, and as stated before, he wasn't the most patient man. Um, and here's a story of some lifelong learning that I want to share with you all about how that impacted, I think, the two of us. Um, he was uh, known for being a very natty dresser. Uh, you heard Sam refer to how, or Cliff, how organized he was. His closet was always you know, pristine. I'm a slob. <laughs> and uh, he came into my room once when I was a teen and was just dismayed and very angry at just how horrible I kept my clothes. I mean, it, it, it was a disaster. And um, he admonished me for it publicly. And I said to him, I said, you know, Dad, I don't really know what you're talking about. I don't know what you want me to do. I didn't know, I didn't have the skill set. And it was, it was in, this, um, in this sort of moment of clarity, we paused. And he stopped and he goes, oh, well, let me show you. And he showed me how to hang my shirts. And he showed me how to hang my pants and how to, because it was very important to him. It was part of something that he was very good at. And, and it was this mutual, um, this mutual way that we learned from each other. We, it was, it was uh, something, I mean, this was 50 years ago. It still has a huge impact on me. And I think modeled, you know, children learn what's caught, what, not what's taught, like my mom said, modeled this, the humility that one can learn from one's children, as well as a child can learn from one's parents. And I, 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 uh, I wanted to convey that. Uh, he was a devoted 
Um, um, let me just see what the heck this means. <laughs> he was a devoted husband uh, who honored his wife in, in, in a number of ways. And uh, I like to think that I do that with my wife, Susan. I, I will say that I fail, but I try. Another thing that my mom did that I want to remind everyone of, certainly the Dublin boys know this, that when dad was rules chairman, there was a big issue with um, every day they would make announcements in the, uh, at the uh, beginning of a session with a variety of just mundane pedestrian comments that needed to be gotten through. And when they started televising the sessions, it was, uh, they couldn't figure out how they could sort of push through that uh, those boring announcements and um, and not uh, bore the uh, the public who had to watch these things. And Mom said, well, "Why don't you just do it at the end?" <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, that's brilliant! <laughs> it's so simple." I, I, I may have not got it exactly right, but I think it was something a very simple like just do it a different part, and you don't have to bore the entire state of Florida and C-SPAN with stuff that no one cares about, like don't forget to get your parking you know, validated and the, uh, the canteen is out of coffee. You know, they, no one needs to know that. They called that the Helene Dubbin rule, if I remember correctly. <laughs> the, state, the citizens of Florida, thank you, Mom. It was another great lesson he taught me as a, as a father, uh, which is uh, he and Mom, t that um, let your children learn their lessons on their own schedule. Let them figure stuff out. Certainly offer guidance, offer advice. Know that they will do what they will and then honor the lessons that they learn themselves. He was a funny guy. He was a charming guy. He was a musical guy, an energizing orator. Again, some things that I, I think that I have gleaned from him. Uh, as far as just being a funny guy, um, he had a light switch cover in his bathroom that he got from Jess Yarborough. Uh, that was vulgar, okay? I just put it to you that way. It's vulgar. And uh, my son Justin called dibs on it when they can find it because it's just, it's that funny. In fact, it's so funny that my wife made him one similar in her, in her as she's a potter. And he was also a fun guy. Um, he, when uh, Ricky, our, our middle child, uh, was a baby, he and Ricky joined a beauty, a little baby beauty contest together because they both had round heads and blue eyes. And it was, it was, they were like twins. It was beautiful. They, of course, they brought home the hardware. It was awesome. Um, so I'm going to tie this all together with a discussion about my career and my dad and mom's support for it. And it goes around in a circle, but I do want to just discuss it. They weren't really wild about the choice of my career. Uh, but they supported it. Dad got me a job at Roy Bowen's um, horse farm one year, uh, supported my work with veterinary clinics and so forth. And um, they, uh, so they supported me. Um, but then as far as the, what mom and dad conveyed about the importance of public service, you know, I chose a career where I, uh, supported rural farmers and um, uh, the agricultural sustainability as a veterinarian it was very important to me. And then no surprise from Marie and Helene's influence, I went into public service, uh, protecting the great American animal loving public. I worked for the Food and Drug Administration. My role has morphed over time when I'm now an executive coach, which is not really a veterinarian, but my boss says I'm sort of the herd health veterinarian for the herd of the Center for Veterinary Medicine. So that kind of fits. Um, interesting, interestingly, in Dad's later years, he became a mediator, uh, which is essentially a bringer together of people. And I guess um, that, that in that regard, we're not, we really never were all that different. And uh, I'm going to try to get through this. Um, God help us all. But it, it brings to my mind a prayer from our prayer book that um, it goes like this. These are the things that are limitless of which a person enjoys the fruit of the world while the principle remains in the world to come. They are honoring one's father and mother, engaging in deeds of compassion, arriving for study morning and evening, 
early, dealing graciously with guests, visiting the sick, providing for the wedding couple, accompanying the dead for burial, being devoted in prayer, and making peace among people. But the story, the study of Torah encompasses them all. And I like to think that the legacy of my dad and all of us is making peace among people, mom included, and all of us. And thank you all. And with that, I believe I will invite the grandchildren up. Okay, thank you, Gail. Thank you, Eric. So one of those lessons that uh, Eric had to learn the hard way was to fill the gas tank before taking his date to the prom. <laughs> we were in his father's Alfa Romeo and ran out of gas. But that was one of the lessons. You learn the hard way and you never make that mistake again. So Murray left this legacy of 10 grandchildren to whom he was Papa Murray, as you've heard, and I want to just name them all. Adam, Stephanie, Rob, Jeff, Andy, Greg, Karen, Kellyanne, Ricky, and Justin, and six great-grandchildren, Kinahura. So we're going to invite all the grandchildren to come forward, and a few of them are going to speak about their grandfather, Papa Murray. Can I tell you about my Papa Murray that you don't already know, that his wonderful four sons, my father and uncles, just told you? Um, what can I add that you can't read in the history of Florida and the golden age records of its legislature or the civil rights provisions of its, this state's 1968 constitution that he was responsible for writing? Um, what words can I add that aren't already written large in our, all of the love and kindness and good works of this family that he led, and in any way the best words were his, you know, uh, which he could deliver as sage advice or a hilarious story or both at once. Uh, instead, I'll share a story that's been on my mind about Papa's wisdom and wit uh, rest assured, I remember every detail perfectly, <laughs> even though it happened when I was four. <laughs> I was with my Papa Murray and Grandma Helene. We were at his father's house, my great-grandfather Albert's house. Papa and Grandma spent the whole time cleaning up everything in sight, putting items in boxes, labeling, organizing. At one point, Papa asked me if there was anything I liked, and I picked up a solid glass cube, too big to be a paperweight, containing like 50 artfully arranged, pristine pennies, all from 1970, frozen in time. I still have it. I didn't realize it, but this was all because great-grandpa Albert had just passed away. The day went on, and I found Papa alone in the garage, his arms overburdened, he was concentrating on something, and I said, Papa Murray, I'm bored. Papa paused, turned to look at me, took in all the air around him to respond, and he put it all into one word, tough. <laughs> it got me to realize whatever was going on, it, it wasn't about me. It's the first time I can remember being aware of that. Papa knew how to use a hard word and deliver it with love and significance so that it would have a profound impact. Of course, when Papa would tell this story, I, it always ends with me running away from him in exaggerated tears, going to Grandma Lee and saying, Papa said tough to me. 
Like I said, sage wisdom and comedic gold, both at once. But looking back, it must have been such a hard situation for him, heavy as an anvil. And the strong word that he chose in that moment was a hammer. It helped shape me. His words were wielded with love and gravitas. They shaped this family and this state for the better. He was a great man and a good person. We named our son Marcus with Papa's initials, MHD. So Marcus would always know that it's at least possible to be both of those things at once. They met a few weeks ago after almost two years of video chatting and Papa had only the sweetest words and, and most joyous laughter for Marcus. And uh, very soon after that, Papa passed in peace, surrounded by his loving family. I got to benefit from, we all got to benefit from his wisdom and wit, his goodness and greatness. For so long, I, and when I think of how Marcus got, got it for so little, that's when it's tough. Tough! <laughs> I think if I think of him every time I hear that word, in a way, he won't really have left. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's so good to see all of you, some for the first time in years. It's a sad day, but um, if I know one thing about my Papa Murray, he did enjoy a reunion. <laughs> I'm Rob, one of Murray's grandkids, and um, with all the stories you've already heard today about his achievements, his towering integrity, his personification of Miami, his love of boating, and his even greater love of no longer having a boat. <laughs> When I consider the 40 years we got to spend together and pondered what to say today, the impact he had on me, I felt compelled to speak um, and dwell on his marvelous sense of humor. Um, Papa had gravitas the way the sun has gravitas. He's represented so, many, so much to so many people, and for a time, he even had that parking pass that let him park wherever he wanted in Miami Beach. <laughs> true power. <laughs> but from behind that imposing facade would come these sharp little observations that crackled with comic awareness, especially of himself. Papa Murray had status, but knew how to undermine it, a king and a jester combined. He had the most incredible concision, always able to say so much with so little. You've heard the legends of have fun kids and tough and maybe the forever record holder for years of laughter uh, to words in a joke, the light switch. <laughs> um, so many years of laughter around things that Murray said, so much uh, return on just a few words. Papa's humor was also powered by a world-class situational awareness. I don't think you can continue to work as a mediator into your 80s without having this preternatural sense of who's in the room, what's between them, and what's gonna shake it loose. When Murray's gimlet eye fell upon you, it was like getting scanned by some futuristic truth machine that happened to come from 1929. I tried to think of a concrete example here and could only come up with every single interaction we ever had. <laughs> Still, I, I tended to willingly share my truth with Papa Murray just because I wanted to know what he'd say. That was another crucial part of what, to me, always made him so funny. He saw reality from his own unique angle. He never dealt and received wisdom, just the sum total of his, ex of his experience. Sure, he was a legendary attorney who bucked the trend of 1970s conservatism to be a force for progressivism in Florida. And yes, that could make him intimidating. But he was also the guy who once won a contest in Alaska for writing a limerick about a moose. Papa Murray valued interesting choices over conventional ones. And that made it easy to go to him with anything unconventional. Career choices, life choices, my queerness, the world. He revered his own history, but resisted generational cliche. 
If anything, he personally brought back the bow tie. <laughs> About a decade ago, through sheer coincidence, I learned that a neighbor's stepdad and my Papa Murray had served in the Florida legislature together. We put them back in touch over email, and in Howell Ferguson's note, the first thing he mentioned wasn't the work they'd done or the challenges he faced. It was the dub and wit. Most jokes don't hold up for a week, but Papa's humor was top of mind for this guy after decades. And then, a few weeks ago, when it was clear we'd reached our final approach to this terrible day, I phoned Papa Murray over his Bluetooth hearing aid, thank you, Uncle David, which seemed to give you direct access to his mind. I asked, how are you, Papa? And after listing all of the intersecting and escalating challenges his body now faced, he paused and said, but other than that, I'm fine. <laughs> the man had timing, panache, a pristine moral compass, and the humility to self-deprecate. We're all here because we're going to miss him. As Papa himself once foretold, it'll be tough. But I will think of Papa Murray every time I tell a joke so dry that half the people in the room don't notice it. <laughs> I will follow his example to rely on my own true north whenever someone comes to me with a difficult problem. I will, out of respect, never so much as attempt a limerick about a moose. I love you, Papa Murray. Thanks for everything. Um, thank you so much to everyone who's come to share this day. It's an honor to follow all those wonderful speeches from my family and honor my grandfather. Um, losing Murray is devastating. He brought so much light and kindness into our lives, and it's okay today to ugly cry. But I'm reminded of Murray's classic tantrum redirection technique, which was to preempt our baby drama with a comically bombastic sobbing sound. It sounded something like <laughs> I want to echo what the rest of my family has said about Murray's extraordinary moral character and his record of public service. He made so many honorable contributions in the state of Florida and Miami, and I, I continue to learn about the amazing campaigns he led to expand public education, pr promote diversity, advocate for fundamental human rights, and to reach across the aisle and compromise and forge alliances, and to utterly defeat his political foes, who were nihilistic, jaundiced by racial and gender prejudice, and motivated by greed. <laughs> Murray was a Jewish king. Murray's intense curiosity about his history, our ancestors' passage from the Pale of Settlement in Imperial Russia, to escape persecution and pursue the American dream impressed me from childhood. From the moment when I must have been six or seven, he shared with me a zine about Dubbin history and genealogy that he researched, composed, and printed at what must have been a 1990s Kinko's. I made regular visits to see Helena Murray six or uh, seven years ago when I lived down the street from them in downtown Miami at the Venetia Condominium, and they were at the Paramount Bay. Uh, I recorded interviews with them where I gained an even deeper appreciation of what my family overcame to make a rich life in America. And I look forward to having the opportunity to share more of those insights with anyone interested. But um, in the interest of time, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on Murray's equally brilliant creative legacy, which, as you've heard, has provided aesthetic inspiration to those of us who are lucky enough to enjoy quality time in his company. Murray, like me and my brothers and so many of my cousins, uncles, and aunts in this family, was an artist. He chose his words with loving precision, he could sing a gentle tune, and he enjoyed drawing and sketching in his spare time, including a charming illustration of a bearded, bespectacled, presumably Ashkenazi lumberjack chopping down an oak tree on the cover of that genealogy zine I mentioned earlier. The significance of the oak was the origin of our name Dubbin, derived from the Ukrainian word for oak tree. Our ancestors likely assumed the name based on the craft they practiced in the forests of Eastern Europe. 
It is impossible for me to take for granted Murray's gifts for sharing information that way with a deft hand and a charming line. In an early stage of his semi-retirement, he entertained the idea of competing in the Miami Herald's contest for a new comic strip in the funny pages. Murray called it Mango City. And in the comic sample that he submitted, he satirized the absurd, unsustainable, and contemptible lengths, perhaps shortcuts, that real estate developers might stoop to to extract value from our beautiful natural landscape and construct towering projects that might never be completed or subsumed in the ocean. It was rendered in hot pastel colors. It was dry and it was funny and it was a little niche and it was not accepted by the Miami paper of record. <laughs> I'll always fondly remember the two of us um, sitting side by side in the Paramount Bay co condominium. Uh, I'd brought him clipboards, craft paper, pencils, and charcoal, hoping to stimulate his creativity in the last decade and we would sit side by side sketching portraits of Grandma Helene. Murray's ability to listen to us, affirm our lives, and make indispensable suggestions, offer us priceless, artful feedback, that will stay with me forever. And uh, I wanna share this story, this short, uh, very quotable piece Murray shared with me about eight years ago, and which I recall transcribing immediately in the same notes app from which I am currently reading. The story goes, a pilgrim ascends the great mountain to meet the great stage. And when he gets there, he begins, oh, tell me, master, what is the meaning of life? Life, the wise man replies, life is like a waterfall. The traveler responds, oh, oh, that is wonderful. Tell me, tell me, great guru, why is life a waterfall? The guru pauses and sighs. You're right, maybe life is not a waterfall. <laughs> if anyone understood the meaning of life and knew how to share it, it was my Papa Murray. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kellyanne. I am Eric's oldest. I did not prepare because I caught the dub and cry gene, so I assumed I, it wasn't worth writing something down because I would just sob, and now that I said it, I might. Um, when I think of Papa, I would say 90% of what I think of is the love that he had for Grandma. And Grandma's my hero, <laughs> and she always has been. Um, and, and the love he had for all of us. I am a social worker, sorry. And I became a social worker because grandma was a social worker. And Papa pushed very hard for me to go to FIU. And he would say, I made FIU for grandma to be a social worker. Go to FIU and be a social worker. Um, but I went to Maryland instead. <laughs> um, oh, I lost my train of thought because now I'm so nervous, but Papa Murray was always very, very, very supportive of everything I did. And nothing I do makes a lot of linear sense. So like, my bachelor's is in social work, so obviously I was taught high school cooking. We didn't cook when I was growing up, I don't know how to do that. And then I finished that and I moved to Wyoming to be a, a table busser in the middle of Yellowstone National Park. And then I finished that and I got my master's, and I moved to the North Carolina mountains, actually literally down the street from Uncle Cliffy's house. Um, and even, even as random and wild as these things were, he was always very supportive. One of maybe five people who were supportive, <laughs> but it was more than enough. And a couple, so I live in North Carolina, I live in Raleigh now, and Maybe his 80th birthday? Maybe. We went to Banner Elk. The one in North Carolina? Mm hmm. See, look, I didn't prepare. Uh, some time ago, we went to Banner Elk, North Carolina, um, for his party. All of us were there. Three weekends ago, me and my girlfriends went to Banner Elk for like a weekend trip. And we go to some random restaurant that my friend Autumn found on Google. And it was a restaurant that we went to as a very big family on that trip. 
And Papa dropped me and the, my brothers off and Grandma, and he told Ricky, he said, don't let anybody get fresh with Grandma. <laughs> Which to us was kind of absurd. Because, like, duh. But anyway, I love him. Thank you all for being here. I love being part of this family and being part of him. When we see all those bright faces and hear their words, it's easy to see how Murray lived till 93. He had so much to keep him alive. Uh, you know, one thing that hasn't been said that I'm just going to end with is that his Hebrew name was Moshe. Moshe, Moses, who was this fearless leader, this fighter for justice, Moses, who we still talk about today because he left such a legacy. And I know the same is true for Murray, that you all will honor his memory when you live in the way that he lived at his highest moments, when you are fighters for justice, when you tell funny stories about him, when you continue to love each other and to care for Helene. And in this way, he will live on as long as you live. Zichrono Livracha, may his memory be a blessing to all of you. I'm going to call up Eric now to close us out with these words of, from Hashki Venu, one of our prayers. So we talked a lot, we talked about dad's uh, musical legacy, his ukulele playing, and somehow I, my ukulele expanded, and I, now I'm a guitar player, I'm a, uh, a singer for our synagogue, I'm in Frederick. The song I'm going to sing is called Hashki Venu. It's about, it's a prayer you say at night before bed, asking God to put a shelter of peace over us, to watch over us. And uh, it's a lovely song, I actually sang it at Jeff and Marta's wedding as well. And, uh, and it's a prayer for us all, certainly for Papa, to put a shelter of peace over all of us. Hashki Venu Adonai Eloheinu l'shalom Ha'amideinu shomreinu L'chaim Spread the shelter of your peace over us Guide us with wisdom Compassion and trust Hashki Beinu Adonai Eloheinu Lishalom Bahamideinu Shomreinu Lecha It's actually a prayer for Sukkot Shalom, so it's perfect, just perfect for today, a shelter of peace. God, you give us loved ones and make them the strength of our life, the light of our eyes. They depart and leave us bereft on a lonely way. But you are the living fountain from which our healing flows. 
To you, the stricken look for comfort and the sorrow laden for consolation. O God, we see life as through windows that open on eternity. We see that love endures and the soul endures as you, O God, endure forever. We see that the years are more than grass that withers, more than flowers that fade. They weave a timeless pattern in a world that is the dwelling place of your glory. And I invite you, if you're able, to please rise for our closing prayer. Shochen Bameromim Ham Seim Menuchan Chona Trachad Kanfei Hashikina Im Kedoshim Utohorim Kezoharakia Mazhirim Et Nishmat Moshe ben Aharon vereza shahalach leolamo baal harachamim yastirehu betzeter kenafav leolamim vitro vitro hachayim et nishmato Adonai hu nachalato veyanuach b'shalom al meshkavu v'nomar Amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Murray Dubbin, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in your eternal presence and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. As we are waiting for just an announcement or two, I want to share for those of you who are not able to go to the cemetery, it does sound like it's still raining out, the family will be at the cricket club following the cemetery in the communal room on the ground floor until 7.30 tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the family, I just want to thank each and every one of you for being here. In just a moment, we are going to head over to Mount Eagle Wayne to lay Mr. Murray Dunn to rest. To get there, we are not going in a formal police escorted Yeah. 